No matter where you are, there are certain things you can always expect to find in a music scene. Someone's making music in a garage, someone else is playing pop songs on an acoustic guitar at a pub, and somewhere, someone's keeping the punk spirit alive. Punk rock holds a crucial place in the musical ecosystem. It's subversive, direct, and both easy to start, but difficult to master. If you have something to say, punk rock offers a powerful outlet. This is Kingston Live, and today Peter and Riley sit down with a band that's proudly carrying the punk flag in the city. Master Nate and the Reprobates only kicked off in 2020, but their roots stretch back nearly two decades. Before starting the band, guitarist and singer Nate Amy was the principal songwriter of Sofa King Addicted, a local four-piece whose mix of punk and ska earned them fans far and wide. Now with bassist Danny Addicted and drummer Kyle Cochran, Master Nate and the Reprobates carries on that same spirit, but expresses it using a much wider sonic palette. These new horizons have inspired the band and unlocked a truly epic volume of music. They've just released album four of an eight-part Diem series, which sees the band exploring themes of personal history, politics, society, and everything in between, through expressions of rock, folk, and punk. Let's start by uh, introducing ourselves. Well, I'm uh, Master Nate from Master Nate and the Reprobates. And I'm uh, Danny Addicted, the bass player. Thank you for joining us on Kingston Live. So let's start off. Uh, I want to talk about you guys are obviously a punk band in Kingston, and there's such an interesting punk scene in Kingston. Uh, people always talk about when you, you talk about the punk scene in Kingston, the first thing they go to is venues that aren't around anymore, like the right, Scherzo, right. where the Duke is, or where Time to Laugh Comedy Club used 477. to be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel that reflects uh, the current state of the, the punk scene in Kingston? Do you really need a dedicated punk venue, or is punk kind of where you, you put it what how do you feel in that uh sense? well i mean i think f first and foremost like uh the places like the mansion and the toucan do a great job of accommodating uh like our types of shows uh especially the toucan like for a band like us like they they treat us really well down there they're you know the, the people that more or less that go to the shows for punk shows are pretty respectable and uh you know they treat the venue staff uh, with respect and all that so uh i think like uh historically it was it was a lot different than what it is today right like i remember when i was in high school like punk shows and metal shows and all that were all in halls like and because you know we weren't all old enough to get into into uh the bars and all that mm -hmm. but you know i remember going to shows at like pros bowling center and steel workers hall and the polish hall and stuff like that in high school when i first started getting into music and uh you know not, not a lot of it has really changed other than the fact that we're you know drinking uh, alcohol inside the venue and not outside <laughs> the song, <right? laughs> i think one key element though in the kingston scene in particular has to be kpp that's the one consistent oh, yeah. factor yeah. that's been there with the changing of some of the clubs that have been mentioned you know you're not going to find the scherzo anymore you're not going to find 477 but those are all places that kpp had a fingerprint on and you know i remember when uh, our sister band sofa king addicted was playing some of the first kpp shows that were in, in the basement of 477 they didn't even have it on the main floor but i think props should be given to kpp because there was always that punk element in Kingston, but what they kind of did was harness it and give a, a clear-cut avenue to some of these venues. And they did all the liaison work with, with the venues, which, let's face it, especially early on, no one wanted to host punk shows in their venues. It just had yeah. a stigma mm -hmm. that bathrooms are going to be destroyed and things are going to get broken. But it took people like Mark and Moira to really do that legwork and build the rapports and relationships with the club owners here in Kingston. And because of that, I think is why there's such a 
to this day a, a strong backing of it in places like Dan had mentioned there, yeah. the mansion, Toucan, and, and now they've got now the, the Broom Factory. Yeah, the Broom Factory yeah. opening up there, which is a wonderful place. I was at uh, the Wilhelm Scream show there and I was blown away by how cool that venue is. I'm it's wild to see to Wilhelm this. Scream there, play, like a, mm -hmm. play like a... a, a matinee show right. <laughs> so early yeah, in the day like, yeah. it was like three o'clock in the afternoon and i was yeah. like sitting there and like i like i was i didn't even have tickets i'm like i'm i'm like eh, it's three o'clock in the afternoon yeah, i think i'm gonna go to a show <laughs> <laughs> so it's down the street from where i live it reminds me of the strung out live in a dive album because when you hear yeah. the banter in between songs he's like oh it's a pretty early for a punk show i hope no one had to skip out of work or school to get here <laughs> so they do happen and yeah. sometimes with the best bands you can hope for <laughs> That, that album is so good too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, like I think it's immediately before they play every day. There's just some guy in the back, just every, every fucking, fucking day. day. Yeah. <laughs> I just wait ripped. for that every time it's that so song good. comes up. <laughs> now, on the topic of like earlier shows, how how do you guys feel about the earlier shows? I feel like that's a thing that. It's kind of being explored a little more these days, and it's like the earlier times. Uh, yeah. I, I certainly have noticed a lot of places uh, like doing more like in a you know seven to eleven o'clock shows. Uh, some of my friends that own like venues in Montreal have changed to that format. Every show is different, and it has its own appeal. And you know what works for one show may not work for another. So mm. I've, I personally haven't played a show at three o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> off the top of my <laughs> off the top of my head, but. If that opportunity comes around, well, which it is eventually here uh, in June, but yeah, it should be interesting because they like everyone that I've heard of that's been in town has been really successful. Like even going back to like when Cancer Bats was at uh, the mansion mm -hmm. a few months back, like that was sold out, and that was like I think that show was over by seven o'clock. You know, <laughs> uh, Wilhelm Scream show was sold out. Protest a Hero that's coming up. Uh, by the time this airs may have been passed, but uh, you know, that's sold out as well. So it seems mm -hmm. to be working, you know, if it's, if it's not broke, then don't try to fix it, I guess. The early days did have some differences though. It, in my mind, it reminds me of like the pioneer land grab days because this was <laughs> such a new thing and there weren't really pre-existing unwritten rules. Everyone was kind of feeling it out. So I've pulled out old sets that, you know, Sofa King Addicted was playing at old KPP shows, and I look at the number of songs on there, and I'm like, geez, we were playing, like, close to an hour set for this. <laughs> it just because, like, you know, sets hadn't really kind of gotten to the standard that they are now, where they're usually about a half an hour, you know, a solid power. So just even kind of looking back to the infancy of the days in, in the Kingston shows and the Kingston punk shows specifically, it's just kind of a neat to see how it's it's matured as it's gone and and you get a much more professional feel and again that's largely all due to kpp's work over the years and while we're talking about early days you guys do have some <laughs> some root back in the ska scene way way back and you can pick up a little bit of that influence in some of your music and i kind of want to talk about like the evolution of ska in kind of in pop culture and in punk rock because it seems like nobody wants to admit they still listen to ska anymore <laughs> and like what's the deal i love ska let's bring it back oh i'm with you 100 yeah, percent. <laughs> i'm one of the biggest proponents for ska music and especially its history most people don't realize this but ska music outdates reggae it was mm -hmm. born in jamaica before reggae music was reggae music probably wouldn't exist today if it weren't for ska music to back it up ska was a mixture of calypso and mento music that was basically put in a melting pot down in jamaica so that was our first wave of ska it then kind of hit england and England sent a wave back, which was known as the second wave of ska. So then we ended up getting an influence coming back out of California with bands like Less Than Jake, Real Big Fish. So th those are kind of classed as the third wave of ska. The unofficial fourth wave has kind of been coming out of Montreal. So it's a feather in the hat of Canada because, you know, th this is a, a genre of music that's it's reaching around the world and it's got roots everywhere when you start dissecting it so we have the the fourth wave of ska that kind of came out of montreal largely headed by stomp records so my feeling is that ska like punk is kind of never going to die you know it ska music has 
easily got 20 or 30 years on punk even because punk was kind of associated with the 1970s UK with bands mm -hmm. like Sex Pistols, Buzzcocks, late later. And then, you know, we had The Clash, which incorporated some of those ska elements. But I'm with you. Ska is just an amazing music. It's, it's such an uplifting form. It's fun to play. Yeah, it's no, fun, definitely to play. fun to play. Definitely fun to mm -hmm. play. And it goes hand in hand with punk. So I think as long as, you know, punk's out on the street, I think ska is going to be kind of hand in hand with it. Sure. It's Absolutely. one of those genres that like leaves its fingerprints in you. Like you can yeah. hear a band like uh, like Pop or like Jeff Rosenstock or uh, so many bands that like you wouldn't really call ska anymore, but you could listen and be like, these guys, you, these guys <laughs> listened to a lot of ska back in the day. <laughs> yeah, they got that element in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to uh, hard to not have a good time when you're listening to ska music. And I was in Montreal and was hanging out with the Mad Caddies in Sasha kind of hit the nail on the head. He said, well, ska music and the Mad Caddies have always been conducive to a party. And I loved how he <laughs> worded that. I was just like, it's just the right pulse for that party atmosphere, be it the party in your soul or the party that you're going to out in a club. It's just, it's electrifying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Actually, it's funny you mentioned Mad Caddies in the context of, of like a party, because the one time I saw them years ago was like one of the raddest shows I've ever seen. Like there was just such an insane energy in that room. And I think it's partially because, well, it's the music, but it's just the performance that comes with the music. There's like rich instrumentation in ska a lot of the time. You get like, you know, you don't get into a pit with a trombone player that often, but you can at a ska show. And it's, and it's a rad. A hundred percent. And some of that is lost when you bring in the aggression of punk. You kind of lose that lighthearted kind of cut loose and have fun feeling mm -hmm. that just comes hand in hand with ska. You get that in punk too, but ska is just, it's, 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 it's automatically there. It's, <laughs> yeah. And actually speaking, because you mentioned both uh, Less Than Jake and Mad Caddies, and you've got reps from both those bands on the albums. Yeah. Um, can we expect some more some more features on the next few records? Yeah, on the last half of the DM series, we're going to be uh, doing some more collabs and trying to get some guests involved. And you know, actually, we're we're going to be bringing on a guitarist from a local band, even mm -hmm. Radio Wasteland. So Henry Rotz will be hopping on a song. So we value the musicians like Henry just as much as we value Roger from Less Than Jake. So music is about bringing people together and that's largely what these guest appearances are doing you know uh, when I was speaking with Scott and felt him out for sorry Scott Radinsky from Poli he played mm -hmm. on our song the baseball ballad if you're unfamiliar Scott used to be a, an 11 season MLB relief pitcher so he pitched for White Sox pitched for the Dodgers Cleveland Cleveland uh, St. Louis. he was St. Louis then he was the uh pitching coach for LA Angels even. Mm -hmm. So we, we couldn't get a better guest appearance than Scott Radinsky on the baseball ballad. So he agreed to it. He thought it was, uh, you know, he said it sounded like fun, so he was all up for it. He was really cool to work with too, like in, in, in all of the back and forth, the discussion with him about it. But beyond that, once we got the song recorded, he did his tracking in California and sent it up to us at the Hip House and we did all the mixing there. But that summer, Polly was doing a Canada tour, so when they were passing through Toronto, we made arrangements to meet up with them, and we filmed half our video on the rooftop of the venue that they were playing in Toronto. So just for music bringing people together, you can't get better moments than that. They're just so organic and so genuine. You know, I Scott Radinsky has no reason to talk to me other than we love the same music. We have that same passion, and that's transferable, whether you're a guy from Kingston or you're a guy who pitched in the major leagues for 11, 11 seasons. So it just it's bringing it all together. And in the cases of some of these bigger names, it's based solely on they see the merit of the vision, mm -hmm. and that's backed by the same passion. It's transferable from me to Roger in Less Than Jake down in Florida, to Scott Radinsky over in California. We've got two of the Mad Caddies that have hopped on tunes as well. And again, it all boils down to that same core element that they, they believe in that vision. 
and that is punk and ska and and why you're making it so it all it all boils down to that that common ground and part of that vision that uh, you gave a quick mention to is the DM series that you are, for people unfamiliar, that is an eight album series <laughs> yeah, that you are working on right now. An absolutely Herculean <laughs> effort. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Where did that idea come from? What's that well, feeling Nate, like? Nate, Nate actually started working on it uh, like before I was even part of Sofa King Addicted uh, uh, originally. Yeah, this is and, going back years and years in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the songs are upwards of 20 years old but uh, they weren't always able to be recorded. So this has kind of been building as we were getting Sofa King Addicted going. Uh, Sofa King Addicted typically was a setup with a duo vocalist affair. So all these songs for Master Nate and the Reprobates are kind of just my songs that were more geared towards a single uh, vocalist. Beyond that, a lot of these songs seem to have uh, themes that would fall into, I guess, some of the darker end of the spectrum and then some of the more lighter end of the spectrum as well there seemed to be a lot of songs that were coming out with the elements of the passage of time as well as the days themselves so when we started grouping these songs it just organically seemed to happen that we had all these albums that that fit the same theme so if you're unfamiliar the diem series Diem is the Latin word for day. So the first album to the eighth album all kind of follow that theme. The albums are the dawn, the day, the dusk, the dark, the next day, the over morrow, in between the days, and in between the nights. And we also have a B-side album of all the songs that were kind of overflow. So we're going to have an unofficial ninth album called In Between the Hours. So we're pretty proud of this because no band or musician from the Beatles to Elvis to the Beach Boys to anyone, no one has ever debuted a band with eight albums. So we were considering trying to get that into the Guinness Book of World Records, but <laughs> figured we would focus our time on booking a tour instead. But uh, jokes aside, you know that's that's a feat that we're pretty proud of, and we're halfway through it right now. So we've, yeah. we've just released the fourth album uh, as a pre-release on Bandcamp. It'll be out everywhere next month, and then we're going to pause and we're going to release our acoustic album in the middle of the DM series. Yeah, so we're looking at really ten albums, but eight of them in kind of like a concept series. <laughs> We've been out of the bathhouse quite a bit. I think, uh, I think uh, which shout out to uh, now Spencer, who is uh, our sound engineer that works on the project out there, and everybody at Bathhouse for having us. But uh, yeah, we've definitely, I think they're getting tired of us being yeah, out I'm, there by now. We've been out there so much. <laughs> I just like, I realized, just pay rent. I realized today that we're back there next weekend, too. Oh, okay, there we are. <laughs> it sneaks up on you, too. The, the idea of eight albums and then a B-Sides album. It's like, we didn't get all the ideas out with the eight. There's another set. It's, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's almost, a, it, it creates a challenge of digestibility. For us trying to, to feed these songs to the public, we've kind of had to sit down and realize that you can't just shove eight albums down people's <laughs> yeah, throats. It's like, yeah, they're gotta, not going to retain it. It's just going to be essentially lost. A little bit so there. Mm -hmm. We ended up coming up with a MNR Monday, or yeah, MNR Mondays. So we're releasing a single each Monday, or highlighting one rather. Yeah. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with Master Nate and the Reprobates, Every Monday, there's going to be a, a single featured that'll give you a little background on the song, so you can kind of ease your way in and start digesting some of this huge project. <laughs> mm. There's an expression that I often refer to for things like a huge project like this, and it's, I can eat an elephant, just not in one bite. <laughs> so we're breaking this elephant down to uh, digestible pieces. Yeah, and, and it's also worth noting on that too. Like, if you do want to sit down and listen to all the, like the first four albums uh, as one full album, we've also gone on to our Bandcamp and put the DM Volume One, and it's actually the first four albums in one album. And we've made it available for thirty dollars instead of forty if somebody wants to buy it. But you can actually just hit play on the first song and listen to all four consecutively that way and we, uh, we had a show at the horseshoe tavern just a couple weeks ago 
And if you're familiar with the Kingston area, you're looking at two and a half, three hours to get to Toronto and then downtown Toronto at that. I put on song one of the first four album package when I left my driveway. The last song on album four ended as I was pulling into the parking lot of the Fortune <laughs> Tower. It was an amazing experience and it was just, it couldn't have been time better. But to give you a scope of how much music there is, there's a good drive to Toronto and you're not going to have to switch the album. So it's, there's yeah. a lot of tunes there. And by and, the time uh, you get the uh, all eight out, that's the full round trip. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It'll get you home again. Yeah, yeah. It's also worth noting though, too, like the way that we record and uh, Nate's writing process and my writing process is really like, we've kind of figured out how to be about as, as efficient efficient as possible like going in there right like sometimes when i go into the studio like when we did the track with roger lima uh, from less than jake um basically i showed up in the studio and i had never heard the song before and nate's like well the first song you're doing like no pressure but you know this is the one that roger lima is gonna sing on <laughs> it's just he's just like the you know the singer and bass player from less than jake and i'm gonna make this up off the top of my head kind of thing and uh but I personally enjoy that challenge of doing it that way, right? Because it kind of keeps everything fresh and uh, and challenging. But uh, it also just means that like we're able to put out this much music, right? Like I think the last time we were out there, Kyle uh, Cochran, our new drummer, I think he <laughs> recorded like 27 songs. 27 songs. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, it was so funny because Niles, the engineer at the Hip House, he didn't realize it until closer to the end of the weekend when he started tallying up how many songs <laughs> Kyle had drummed on. And his exact words was, 27 songs. That's disgusting. <laughs> I felt like such a slave driver. <laughs> you give him a break for Tragically a couple of weeks. Tragically, engineers <laughs> giving sympathy to our drummer. I'm like, man, maybe I uh, should ease up a bit. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Damn. 27 tracks. That's yeah, I give yeah. him credit for uh, keeping composure through all of that. And he... he he slayed them all too. And, mm. You know, Kyle's such a, a slick drummer. He just, yeah, he's, he's a natural. Pro. Yeah. yeah. He just... So I'm not surprised you got through 27, <laughs> but I'm still amazed. Yeah. <laughs> you talked yeah. about uh, very briefly, you touched on the acoustic album in there. And that's yeah. another thing I want to explore a little bit because there's similar to the relationship between punk and ska, there's also such an interesting relationship between like punk and like folk and acoustic. When you look at bands mm -hmm. like uh, Dallas Green from Alexis on Fire going sure. to the City in Color Project or Chuck Reagan going from uh, hot water music doing acoustic stuff or Frank Turner or you look at guys like uh, Brendan Kelly, the list goes on and on. Like punk artists going to do this like similar but entirely different mm -hmm. acoustic I remember even, thing. even like back, back in like in earlier days that it was very common to have like acoustic acts opening punk shows very often. Mm. You know, I think I think I, I, I may be mistaken here, but I think I even remember seeing like Weeping Tile open a show once when I was like 15 or 16 years old, right? And then it was just like a whole bunch of like punk and metal bands the rest of the night. <laughs> it's just like, but it, it's always, a, I always thought it was a really cool way of starting a show off, right? Because you can kind of like wade into it a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But that's very much plays to like the connection between, you know, like the music, right? Because music is just music really at the end of the day. If we zoom out and look back, we had touched on ska and the history of that, how it had 20 or 30 years on punk rock. If you include folk as a kind of the roots of punk rock, then it, it almost lines up to about the same birth time as ska because before you had the rock and roll, it was, you know, beatnik folk musicians that were out there in the, the 50s and probably even before that that were playing at places that weren't allowed to have shows, kind of like punk rock. So <laughs> they were doing it at speakeasies and you had to know where to go. You had to kind of be a part of that scene to gain entry. So I, I think that folk is kind of punk rock before punk rock knew what it was. Well, yeah, I mean, like there's certainly, you know, counterculture, rebellious nature of a lot of music that is, you know, historically very popular from folk music, right? So. It's two two very important things for both uh, styles of music. Yeah, they, they both have something valid to say. You know, that's personally my biggest beef with mainstream music is you've got the attention of the masses, so many people, and what is your message to them? Ooh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very profound, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, 
the best th things that get said are the, the things worth saying, you know, so sometimes uh, less can be more. So we hear the same songs repeated on the radio and those songs to begin with aren't really saying a whole lot. Don, I think you, you, you just nailed it with the the connection between folk and punk and and it's the it's the fact that like the music itself leaves this leaves room for the message you know it's like in the case of both genres it's like you you can get as technical like you know instrumentally as you want but the key thing like the thing that defines that genre is the the fact that like it's it's three chords with a message <laughs> yeah it's about something yeah I think that's actually close to the uh, Professor of Rock slogan, three chords in the truth, my friends. Oh, that's good. <laughs> well said. <Yeah>, I... <laughs> well, and I think one other thing that I noticed with um, with some of the music you've released is there's also kind of connecting with folk as well. There's like this storytelling, like historical element to it. And the, um, oh, there's a track of yours. Yeah, Another Man's Life. It's like you're, you're telling a very specific event and a very local one. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. Yeah. That was a, a true story that happened to my family and I guess the family across the road. So when I was uh, um, probably about 12 to 13 in, in that neighborhood, uh, my parents were building a new house and we had to vacate our old house maybe about a month or so before our new house was going to be ready. So during that interim, we all kind of temporarily moved into my grandparents' house. So all the bedrooms were taken. So me being the youngest, I was set up with the mattress on the living room floor. So this was in the fall and it was getting close to Halloween. And the one night while sleeping, I heard just screams at the at the door and, and the door trying to be open and the windows trying to be open and and the screaming was to the effect that Ricky had been shot and so at that point my parents and grandparents came running down from upstairs and we ended up hiding that family while the cops came to, to look for the killer and what had happened was it was an ex-husband who came back with the sole intent of murdering his ex-wife and her new boyfriend and he was going to abduct the kids. He even took the time to slash the tires on the kids' bikes so that if they got out of the house, they wouldn't be able to take off on their bikes. He, he wanted to make sure that he got, I guess, custody of them in, in one form. So what had happened was he had a shotgun and he shot Ricky Boudelier in the chest. And while Ricky was dying, the mother and the children ended up getting out of the house and they ran through the fields to my grandparents' house. So, and again, from my perspective, I was the only one on the living room floor. So it was just a very strange experience, you know, one that I won't forget. And it was hard to, I guess, process it even at the moment you know we we had to go to school the next day mostly because the family was still at our house and detectives were coming to talk to them so i think it was probably easier to get us out of the house but still you go to school that day and it, it's just a uh, very surreal you know it doesn't feel real so that song is definitely a special song you know not just to me but to my family as well and how we often word it when we play this song live is that a man had to die for this song to be written. So that's a pretty profound statement, and there's a lot of truth in it. I was young when this happened, so I didn't really know Ricky Boudelier, but reading up on him, he was a prison guard in Napanee. But beyond that, he was a big music fan, and his co-workers remembered him as being someone that would often sing. So... I know that we feel pretty honored to try to do right by Ricky Boudelier by offering a song in his name. So, you know, if Ricky's able to hear us, we, we hope that he appreciates it on the music lover side of him that this was done in his honor. But yeah, that's a definitely a, a bit of a backstory, but that's one of those songs that has a lot of truth and depth to it, and it's real.
Thank you for listening to Kingston Live. Be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. For more great Kingston music, check out the Kingston Live playlist on Spotify. For show listings, artist info, and all things Kingston music, check out kingstonlive.ca. That's an incredible track, man. Thank you very much. Like it. mm-hmm. yeah. It's That one, one is actually one that we're using to... Uh, kind of bridge from the Diem series into the acoustic album because mm-hmm. there's an acoustic version of that song and there's an electric version of the song. You can actually go online and we've got two videos that are grouped together as one. So you can watch a, a big video that has both the songs on it and it even has the uh, original newspaper clips from the Napanee Beaver that show... You yeah, know what your, your mom found those for us. Yeah, right? it, yeah wow, just the way down. it worked out. We were cutting the video, and my mom called me and was like, "I just came across the the Napanee Beaver that had the the murder of Ricky Boudelier in it." Yeah. So, and that the acoustic track we actually I think it's the only one on the acoustic album that we all recorded in the same room at the same time. I yeah, because other, the other ones we did track by track kind of stuff, but that one was the first one that we did from the acoustic album, and we recorded it live off the floor. Uh, 
Again, we didn't want to really lose any heart to this song in studio editing. We wanted it to be as real as the song as story, itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's like a the video itself. It's like the nine minute video. The first half is you guys in the studio, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It'll it, it starts playing live off the floor in the mm-hmm. studio, and then the second one is like clips of. A couple other fun facts of that actually. If you, if you're watching that video. If you look over my shoulder, you're going to see the Phantom Power board that I was... I thought used. I saw yeah. that. <laughs> that's yes. the actual board that's the CD case now. Oh, my God. Okay. I was like, <laughs> Unreal. I was Unreal. Like, that looks like Phantom Power. <laughs> it gets even better, okay? The, for the video that you watch, we, we did the lip, lip syncing thing. So, you know, we're kind of faking that we're playing it as you're watching this video. I have my classical guitar in the video that's got a very custom paint job. That's not the guitar that you're actually hearing on the recording, though. When we went to record this song, there was this really unique acoustic guitar case. It said it was rated for 5,000 pounds. So, like, Jeez. something special is supposed to go in this. Yeah. So, asking Niles, like, you know, what, what guitar's in there? And he's like, oh, that's Rob Baker's guitar that he recorded ahead by a century on. <laughs> and I was like, can, can I use that? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. So the guitar you're hearing when you listen to Another Man's Life, the acoustic version, is the Ahead by a Century guitar. And wow. It was, it was yeah. not in the best of shape. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pulled it out of there. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty rough. He's like, it needs bridge work, but I'm like, we'll, we'll make it work. Up. <laughs> yeah. but I, I can see why he used it, because you, you hear the tones that that guitar is putting out. And it's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool experience. It was that. the right decision to do it on that versus the classical. It's like Napanee history stacked with Kingston slash <laughs> yeah. Ontario history. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, just uh, very organic. The way it all all happened, kind of naturally. So it's mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. So check out that video. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Another man's life is on YouTube. Dan actually cut that video. It oh, took yeah. me a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't do any of our video work after that <laughs> no. anymore. It's, it's so much more time consuming than you think. Oh, it's every tedious, time. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I tricked him into doing that real good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It'll be easy, I say, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Between that and the twenty-seven tracks, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got some serious powers there. <laughs> I guess I'm kind of sadistic, but <laughs> you're not coming back to me. Well, fortunately, now the video set, like the baseball ballad video, and uh, the fuck everyone video we're done by Paul Ferguson, who mm. also plays in uh, Screaming Sins, the guitar player. Yeah, shout and, out to Paul here, another great Kingston musician. Yeah, mm. he's doing the the travel show, like he's doing all the editing and all that and stuff for us. And it's his birthday as we're recording this today. So happy birthday, Paul. Oh, happy, happy birthday! Happy birthday! Yeah. <laughs> it, it'll no longer be his birthday when this comes out, but I hope he, he gets to enjoy this in some way. I hope enough. you had a good one, buddy. Yeah, Set yeah. a reminder Happy on your phone to listen to this podcast next year. On yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Awesome. Well, you guys just mentioned the travel show. Let's talk about, uh, you got a lot of travel kind of coming up. You've got a lot of yeah. touring planned. Indeed. Yeah. It's going to be pretty fun. Uh, we're going to tour Canada. Well, not all of Canada, but... Ontario, Quebec. Ontario, Quebec. Uh, then fly to Costa Rica, uh, play a few shows there. Then we're flying to Australia from from Costa Rica. Oh, yeah. And there's an Australian band on this tour with us, so they're going to be flying to Canada to join us right at the start of it. And then we're going to end the whole tour with them in their home country. Yeah, so they're doing all three legs of the tour with us. They're called uh, Kathleen Turner Overdrive. Which, if um, you know, I hope you caught it. It's yep. it's a pretty good nod to Bachman Turner Overdrive. So like we were amazed. We're like, you guys have a Canadian nod. Yeah, that's yeah. So cool. That's amazing. Yeah, we were t- we were pretty taken with that. Yeah. They they charmed us for sure. It's fascinating to me too when we're talking to the Australians that we're working with. Like what, how much of different parts of Canadian culture and music has made it down there? Right. Like uh, the one guy. Was I, I made a, a joke about Rocky and Bullwinkle, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. And I was like, "Oh, I didn't know that you guys had that wow. show out there." It Dang. gets better. Dig this, okay? I was asking them. I'm like, "You guys, have you guys heard of the Trailer Park Boys?" <laughs> oh, we love the Trailer Park Boys. He's like, "Australia's got their own Trailer Park Boys." Yeah. I'm like, "What? You're, you're kidding me?" He's like, "No, no, check it out. It's called Houseos." Houseos, okay? So, They've got a, a different way of like saying names, like a. Darren, if they want to shorten it up, you know, like we'd probably, hey, Dare, how's it going? They would call Darren Daza. 
Yeah, it, it's just a, it's a slightly it total sense. different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see how you get from Darren to Daza, but for them, it's kind of a natural thing. Like you know, mm. me saying yeah. Dano or whatever. You know, it's, yeah. everybody seems so, to be really keen on everything down there. Yeah, so that's that they use a lot. So asking him <laughs> about Trailer neat. Park Hold Boys, on. he's like, "Yeah, check out Housos." Now, what Housos means is that's their term for government housing. So we would have oh. like a social assisted living, you know, like mm -hmm. in Napanee, there's a, a few of these uh, uh, buildings that have been converted for, for social assistance living. So down in Australia, they would call that a house unit. So they decided this one guy who, who was very taken by the trailer park boys and who was already a star down in Australia, he's like, I can make an Australian version. So they have house and it takes place in a house O's project that is called Sunnyvale. So it's even a direct <laughs> nod to Sunnyvale wow. Trailer Park on the East Coast. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah. And I checked out a couple episodes, and it's it's a little more zany than what we would be used to with Trailer Park Boys. But 100% to see that Canadian culture coming back at us in the same way that Britain would have sent Ska back to Jamaica, you know, <laughs> after they had kind of manipulated and thrown that ball yeah. back. We're seeing that from Australia already, and it's yeah. just mind-blowing. You know, it's so <laughs> cool to, to have those conversations, asking about the Tragically Hip. The one guy, he's like, I'm sorry to say, but I only know one song from them. <laughs> and we're like, oh, you're going to hear a lot more when yeah, you get yeah. to Canada. Yeah. It was the same with the Bare Naked Ladies. They only do the one song. I mean, yeah. even even knowing one is like yeah, that's pretty good. It's on the radar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's not yeah. bad. So Let's in see. just random things, though, I'm I'm kind of quizzing them. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you guys know the guess who? Do you know this song? <laughs> but we're actually there's method to our madness because we're building our set now. So we're oh, making sure yeah. that anything that we put in it is going to have an impact of some sort. So <laughs> we're going to leave some of the guess who songs off of it, but we are going to do some. Uh, we're going to do ACDC's Big Balls. Yeah. You know, good uh, Aussie uh, nod to mm -hmm. them. Another thing that we were doing is uh, Beds Are Burning. Yeah, a little bit uh, of that. Yeah. Now, as we've learned, that guy has gone on to be a politician in Australia. <laughs> so back when he sang for Midnight Oil, he was really standing up for Aboriginal rights. But from what we're hearing, he's kind of flip-flop now that he's a politician. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, he seems to be a little bit on the right. <laughs> so we're going to see how this song goes over. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Maybe we'll just stick with big balls for yeah. the rest of the tour. We'll but get uh, through half of it and be like, ah, oh, the vibe's yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we're going to big balls. Do, do, do some in excess or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, we also uh, we so we we went to Costa Rica last year, and uh, that's where the the travel show is going to be based on that experience. So I'm pretty stoked to go back because uh, what a what an awesome uh, music culture that we kind of encountered down there. Like uh, I always hear like you know people say that you know Europe is like just such a great uh, you know welcoming to bands kind of thing, but I found that like uh, people down there like when we played like the shows were just like it was just great. And that's the whole kind of concept of the travel show, too. First and foremost, we uh, try to take advantage of every element of a situation. It's like if we're going on tour, we might as well film that show. And if we're going to film that show, we might as well film what's happening around the show. Hell, we might as well film our whole day and try to, you know, commemorate it because we want to anyway. But mm -hmm. while we've got this all filmed, why don't we turn it into something kind of tangible and make it a show? So that's kind of what we've yeah. done. Share now, the experience of being on tour. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Bare Bones Records Hardcore Travel Show Season 1 will take you all the way down to Costa Rica, and it's going to take you to some pretty cool restaurants, but we're also going to take you to some sketchy locations, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the beauty of the show, is every other travel show out there is trying to show you the best of this country. You know, that they're going to intentionally not show you the sketchy areas mm. we're intentionally taking you to the back alleys of costa rica and we're going to intentionally take you to strange places in australia yeah, it's like a bordeanism <laughs> yeah in, in a sense and like uh you know we've been doing our homework for uh australia's season that we're going to do for the travel show 
for example, Melbourne, you probably wouldn't realize this, but it has a penguin colony. <laughs> so we're hoping to it's see they're actually miniature guys. penguins. Yeah. So oh, we're hoping man. to kind of film some of these and, and show you guys all this stuff that we're itching to go see ourselves. You yeah. know, be selfish of us to keep it all to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping to share all these experiences with you. And frankly, I can't believe no band has thought of this previously. Like it's just such a simple it, concept it, it, and everyone's mm. doing it anyway on a tour, you yeah. know, you're trying to film as much as possible. So we're really stoked for the first season to come out again, Paul, <coughs> me. Paul Ferguson's doing all the editing on it. So, uh, we're pretty stoked at this and we're looking forward to making the second season even better. And specifically with Costa Rica, we're able to go back, revisit and follow up on some of the things that we saw or did in, in the first season. So. You know, yeah, we're going to be playing some of the same venues and stuff yeah, like that we, down there. Nice. We went down to a coffee plantation that was on the second highest peak in Costa Rica. Now, to back up, we played a show the night before, and I remember seeing this guy. He played drums in one of the band, and I'm like, my God, that guy's got to be the hardest partier in the room. <laughs> so like, I, I'm like having fun watching this guy more than watching the show, you know, and mm. his name was Jesus, of course. believe it or not. So... <laughs> You know, show ends, and then uh, our guide and driver, they're like, oh, you guys have an invitation to go to a coffee plantation tomorrow. I'm like, perfect, because I'm a big coffee drinker, and I was mm. specifically wanting to bring back some coffee, hopefully from a plantation. So as we're driving up in the mountains to get in there, I learned that this guy kind of was involved with one of the bands, and I'm, I still don't have a face to this guy. So we pull up to the plantation and out walks Jesus. I'm like, oh my God, it's him. <laughs> but this guy must work as hard as he parties because the plantation was just beautiful. We're having some of the best. It was best still kind of like being built when we were there. Yeah, like, like wow. and stuff. Best coffee in the world. And we're sitting literally watching clouds drift by at eye level because we're so high up in the mountains. So like, we filmed all this. So we're looking forward to showing you that. But we're going to go back and we're actually going to do a private show on the plantation. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So you're <laughs> yeah. going to see some more of the plantation on season two. Okay. And I'm hoping to even take the viewer so that you can see more about the coffee being grown and how it's processed and yeah, from the, what I hear he might have some other plants in the <laughs> the this guy every time I saw him even at the show he would run up and hand me a handful of weed so I'm like this guy is a hardcore party nicest guy awesome. in the world too oh yeah, yeah. And, and like just for context like the, the town we had played the night before at that show was Santa Maria de Dota and I believe if I recall it's either 1500 or 1600 meters elevation and wow. when we left to go to the plantation we went towards the sky <laughs> <laughs> so we were up there Man. We uh, yeah. we ended up uh, sampling coffee, and he had all these different kinds. So we're drinking excess of coffee in a high elevation, and then we're going to go down to see the area where these cabins are. That's going to be where we're playing the show mm -hmm. this upcoming this upcoming tour. So we ended up walking down this this kind of road that goes part way down the mountain, I guess, for lack of a better description. Getting down there wasn't too bad. When we walked back up the road after all the coffee and the heat <laughs> yeah. and the elevation and less air, uh, everyone's hearts, from Canada at least, were just jittering, you know? It's like, oh my God. <laughs> so just going turbo. 100%. <laughs> so we're looking forward to going back there, needless to say. And, uh, you know, this travel show, I think, is going to be pretty fun and it's going to have something for everybody. Mm hmm. Well, I'm stoked for Jesus to make an appearance. <laughs> yeah. it sounds like oh, it's yeah. going to be rad. <laughs> we are yeah, too. be in there. <laughs> and while we're talking about shows, uh, if people want to see you live and they don't want to fly all the way down to Costa Rica, <laughs> we've got some local ones coming up. We do, yeah. We were playing uh, the Toucan for Homegrown Music Festival, uh, and we are the 1 a.m. Uh, kind of headlining spot, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about that. Homegrown is is always like my favorite day of the year with all the great acts and uh, from all different types of genres everywhere and uh, if you don't know about uh, homegrown music festival out there it's uh, just a fourth the joe chitlin musical instrument lending library commonly referred to as the mill at the tet center so it's a ten dollar bracelet that gets you into all 13 different venues 
and uh, you can you can go and check out music all day and then funnel into the toucan because we'll be closing it out mm-hmm. we'll be the the very final act on the festival this year so uh, it's pretty cool uh i was kind of blown away when uh jeff chown who was our venue coordinator asked us to play that spot i was kind of i just always like are you sure like you got the right number here <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but all jokes aside uh you know it, it is a festival that like uh, i think is really important the cause is certainly something that's really unique to Kingston music uh, because I believe it was the first one in North America for a, an instrument lending library. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's the next thing we got going on. And then, uh, so that'll be May f- 6th. Yeah, May 6th. Mm-hmm. And then June 4th, we'll be playing as part of the Spring Reverb Festival opening for Belvedere, and that will be at the mansion. And this is, like we discussed earlier, uh, an early three or two to five show, I believe it is now, at the mansion, which is going to be weird being at the mansion at that time playing the show. But... <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think that place could open at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, Belvedere is, is, a, is a, a fantastic band from Calgary, Alberta. When I had a podcast of my own, I actually interviewed him when they were most recent album came out and he's a super nice guy uh, Steve uh, Rawls from that band so it'll be cool to uh, to actually get to share the stage with them and uh, this part of KPP concerts uh, Spring Reverb which has got a you know it's I think this is the second year they've done it and tons of great bands on that as well you know including Belvedere but not limited to yeah it's a good representation of all genres actually from yeah and mm-hmm. at both yeah. shows yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's the I think it was Joe's or the um uh homegrown. There's like a number of venues and they there's like venues divided by genre. So there's like, you know, if you want to go see some punk shows, you go here. If you want to go yeah. see like yeah, some folk shows, it's there. And yeah, I think if I might be wrong about this, but I think Spring Reverb is sort of similar where it's like there's a bit of genre division, so you're able yeah, to sort of yeah. pick and choose. You'll, I think the... Rylan James is actually playing yeah. now. Mm. I have a, a bit of a connection. I used to work with his dad, and when Rylan was first starting out in the Napanee Deserano area, Master Nate and the Reprobates used to lend him our PA so that he no, could I... go perform. <laughs> nice. So now, now Rylan's on Universal Music Group, and uh, actually he played Mansion maybe two years ago just to show the... Uh, the variation in genres because yeah. Rylan would be more of the today's pop music, I guess mm-hmm. might be a, you know, genres get so diluted now, but yeah. uh, you know, it's a, everything from kind of the mainstream to the underground is, is represented at both homegrown and spring yeah. river. Our venue specifically at homegrown at the Toucan is I think four different genres over the course of the day, because it starts with Celtic music. And I believe the, uh, there's a funk band on the bill and then there's punk and what was the other one? Because if you look at the the uh, the online event, it has four different genres listed. It's like Celtic, funk, punk, but I can't remember what the third one is off the top of my head. But uh, but yeah, no, there's some pretty pre- uh, pretty good bands on that with us as well. There's some meringues. Uh, we'll be playing at midnight. And before that is uh, Justin Burden and the Thorns of Venus. That's the the other thing that we should draw attention to is just how much music Kingston has to offer. It's not limited to one genre. Like there's literally a cup of tea for everybody's preference. You know, if you like electronic music, which I know nothing of, (laughs) I know that there's electronic musicians in Kingston because they've got a venue that's dedicated to to electronics. So like even if you want to go check out something new that's outside of your regular wheelhouse, like it's the perfect opportunity to do it. It costs you the same amount. (laughs) And I didn't Mm -hmm. realize this like we played homegrown as sofa king addicted in our sister band and we actually played for dan yeah because before he joined the band so you know i didn't realize it then but this is kind of like a local musician's super bowl if you will like it's an all-day event you can get stoked days before leading up i know that many people that we're associating with like we know a couple bands that are playing in these sh- homegrown shows. Well, and, Radio Wasteland's playing downstairs yeah, mm-hmm. at the mansion. We've mentioned Henry. Henry uh, will be on our the Pink- one of our the songs. The Pinkertons, I believe, are at uh, the Royal Tavern 2.0. Mill Wrights uh, are down at Blue Martini. Yeah. But, like, there, there's just... When you actually take the time to think about it, this is a very unique event, and it's so geared towards music lovers that, you know, I'm not a big sports guy, so I'm, I'm never going to get excited about the Super Bowl. But this is something I can get excited about. And mm-hmm. when we played it last time, I really didn't realize the scope of it. And I'm like, man, like shame on me. 
because this is worth digging into and getting your teeth and like dive right into the homegrown and spring reverb because it's the best of what Kingston has to offer. That would be a good like marketing line for for, for both homegrown and spring reverb. It's like it's the Super Bowl, but for local music. Yeah. <laughs> Please use it, yeah. Mark and Moira. If you're listening, yeah, yeah, snag yeah. that up. With my blessing, Chris. Yeah. If you're out there listening, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming in, guys. This has been a ton of fun Mm -hmm. and uh, super looking forward to the rest of the DM series. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, thank you again. And props to you guys, because without things like this, word doesn't get out and everything we just said stays within. It doesn't get shared. Some of the most inspiring things in the world is, is music and some of the most profound things that get said are in music. So without you guys things go unsaid and people might not get that inspiration so that messages failed to deliver exactly so basically i'd really like to give props to you guys for what you guys do and the, the, the whole crew well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a definitely a team effort so well, thanks thank man. you guys yeah. thank you this has been kingston live we encourage you to rate us on your listening platform of choice and subscribe where possible For show listings, artist info, and all things Kingston music, check out kingstonlive.ca. Kingston Live was produced in Kingston by Soundwise. Hosted by Riley Jabor and Peter Sanfilippo. Voiceovers and technical production by John Sanfilippo. Executive producer, Rob Howard. Kingston Live is a member of the Canadian Live Music Association. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at podcast at kingstonlive.ca. Do we get like a picture or something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I was going to say, yeah, I want to get some pictures too. And awesome. I always forget, but I remember this time. <laughs> also, I have to point out that almost every time I'm out there and the interview's happening in here, there's a moment where I, I need to like, I don't, but I want to run in and interject. And <laughs> when, when, when you're talking about live in a dive, like, every fucking day. But then <laughs> I know, as soon as we started talking about Strong Out, I was like, I can, I can feel John's anxiety in the room right now. <laughs>